Okay, thank you. It's good, I think. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Damian. Um, I'm an architect and a, and a software engineer, uh, self taught, basically. So, I work within the context of design education, and this is my main focus. I'm going to talk about design today. Um, I'm currently at SciArc, uh, uh, which is an architecture school here in, L uh, in Los Angeles. So, I'm going to talk about design in the way how it actually operates. Uh, design works by projecting ideas through a medium or a tool onto the world. And um, the idea does not get simply kind of transmitted to a through a tool. It actually gets, to a large extent, kind of formed by the tool or a medium. But the tool usually retains something that is called transparency, uh, which is how we are kind of, how we kind of forget that we are using something to produce an idea, right? until it actually breaks. And then when the tool kind of breaks, you, you recognize it as an object in the world and because it becomes non-transparent to your attention. Uh, this is where the proce process of like, subject forming happens in the meantime. And Ag Agamben, uh, who is an Italian philosopher, he would say that the apparatus of, of this tool kind of produces its own subjects. Uh, so, Sometimes the tool becomes the map that replaces the territory. So for example, the idea of modern space was invented through the invention of the tool of perspective in the 15th century. And we can say that space did not really exist before this. Um, and perspective in th is this kind of extraordinary idea of automating sight. Uh, it is an idea of producing artificial vision through separating the apparatus from the biological sub substrate of the apparatus. It's a case of abstraction kind of taking off to form an alien, uh, non-human entity that's going to conquer the world at some point. But perspective in its core is kind of nothing more than a grid system. And uh, by describing the rules of seeing mathematically, perspectival vision has produced the modern idea of space, uh, and also the modern idea of the subject in space. So important thing to understand is that perspective does not simulate some natural real, but it actually kind of produces a new kind of real. It's more like an infection or a virus. So in architectural design, uh, Brunelleschi kind of begins this uh, kind of trajectory by using architectural figures such as buildings and ceilings and tile floors, which easily match the grid structure of the projective plane. And later, other objects become fitted and shaped within the geometrical patterning of, of linear perspective. And the obvious tension kind of arises between the grid, which represents the ideal space, and the figures uh, of, of of architecture or uh, other, other figures, or, or bodies, basically. So how to place an object onto the grid uh, becomes the main topic of architectural design for the next five centuries, this relation between the grid and the figure. And the Cartesian space is a further abstraction of this perspectival space, with one difference. It's, the perspective was an abstraction of like embodied vision. Um, coordinate system is an abstraction of what used to be called the internal kind of mind's eye vision, right? It's a way that visual abstraction, th that people thought that the mind represents concepts internally. Um, why am I talking about all of this? Is because the computer, like computer graphics actually kind of inherits this uh, history, right? Like computer graphics comes out, out of radar technology, basically, and two kind of things are important to understand is one is, as you know, I'm sure, one is that function of control that the radar has a, as a default because it's the first image in history of images that has an individual pixel that you can address by pointing um, the idea of interactivity. And the other fact is that radar proves that light is really not needed for vision, actually, which kind of destroys the whole idea of the divine looks of, of uh, like 10 centuries of Christianity and so forth. So the, the apparatus of artificial vision is independent from light, and it's only fully dependent on, on geometry. So what it also means is that we are dealing now within the regime of control. So it's a political thing that's happening here. And all of these kind of things are embedded in every visual framework that we use today. And uh, in every 3D modeling software, the grid is the base of, of operations and the kind of uh, idea of uh, Cartesian subject looking onto the world is also implied. Um, so in architectural design, which is what I'm actually kind of trying to get to is, is this traditional mediums, such as orthographic or perspectival images, they constitute something that we can call an operative, non-reflexive, and quantitative uh, visual field. And it's basically a space of a kind of a goal-oriented diagram that uh, organizes and reinforces uh, 
Cartesian subjectivity, which is based on the idea of fixed observers sitting outside of the world, like looking through a small um, opening. It's basically a kind of a religious idea, um, and perspective has done something more than medieval painting uh, it, that kind of imbued the idea of, of this disembodied observer into the tools themselves, right? So suddenly the idea of uh, a kind of s higher entity is not anymore in the narrative, but it, it kind of becomes embedded in the, in the regime of representation itself. So this visual field is what enables something we can call the design space of total control. And this is, the cons this is now the kind of the conspiracy theory part of my talk, right? That our design space is, is basically secretly governed, right, by the logic of, of Cartesian perspectivalism. Um, and this is what we can think of as a de de default design space, uh, kind of a default diagram of space. And this is something that comes before creativity is possible when you use the modeling, uh, when you kind of try to, to, to design something, right? Um, so it's, it's kind of an invisible scaffold behind any design process. And software is used in design primarily as a simulation of this default space of classical projections, orthographic and so forth. And in that continuation, software is really a, a kind of a continuation of that regime of, of co control. Um, so as you might see in, in all of these interfaces that are used for design, they are kind of like extensions of, of this, of this uh, regime. So, so I'm interested basically in this idea of like other normativity uh, and, and, and like modes of resistance to this normative uh, space. And uh, someone like Marcel Duchamp, who is a French artist, uh, he, he saw this space of norms as, as pure abstraction that started to replace and destroy all other possible modes of thinking. Um, and uh, Duchamp works with chance, error, and contingency as modes of resistance. So this also includes an idea of constructing a kind of a strange dysfunctional apparatuses that only give an impression that they're actually working. This, this implication that as long as a man-made thing looks very complex and inherently uh, kind of internally coherent, right, people will infer meaning from it. He was playing with this idea since like 100 years ago. That this idea of something pretending to work uh, and in such a complex way is a trigger that questions like totalitarian practices and to irony and, and, and fundamental doubt, uh, basically. He was a, I think he was a kind of a grandfather of, the, of today's meme culture. So the project I'm presenting actually is called Become the Internet, is, is a visual studies seminar that I teach with a colleague, Angelica Lorenzi in, at SciArc. In the seminar, we kind of explore software as a format for a possible extension of traditional architectural mediums of representation um, and, and we are trying to set out like conditions of resistance to this uh, kind of grand meta narrative that I now have, have walked you through. Um, and we understand software as kind of an interactive uh, uh, drawing apparatus that is that where, where we are working with screenshots and uh, kind of raw unfiltered expressions for, for aesthetics. So the software we design is called Platform Sandbox and we l work a lot with like game engines and stuff. And the main constructive elements are taken from the default operations of the de uh, design software. There is like an interactive uh, camera. Th there is a lot of Cartesian grids and like default lighting. And uh, students work, work like towards transforming these defaults into a more realistic or more weird environments like this ones, uh, while retaining the visibility of the scaffold. Um, so it really operates as a pedagogical kind of uh, uh, thought uh, proposition. Um, so uh, this is made in, in, uh, in a, a game engine and it works through like sampling and remixing digital ready-mades and then we kind of deploy them in this non-deterministic procedures to, to kind of simply bash things together that don't really belong together as, as a means of like extending an idea what it means to, to make something. So the user interface was designed to resemble a standard or default way of software but it actually works more like a game. And I, uh, games for me are, ver are very important because they tend to problematize this idea of subjective agency through either exposing and putting into question the ability of a player or by kind of disturbing the, what it means to, to have a goal. Uh, so, 
every, I mean, we have maybe about 50 something students and each student produces a different version of this uh, environment where they're working towards like total self-expression without any recourse to, to what it might be, what it might mean to uh, work in a classical way. So the rules of the game set up infinite remix, re kind of remix culture of the objects in relation to their origin. And uh, interaction is only possible like in the main view. We don't work in plans or sections, which are like classical tropes of design. And each uh, session is limited to 10 minutes. Uh, after this, everything is deleted. And kind of the software restarts and you have to do another thing. Uh, so you can only export like screenshots or, or videos from it. And the process becomes kind of more imprecise or messy and, and faster. And, as, and there is a kind of an element of randomness and, and uh, kind of chance operations because things suddenly appear uh, in, in, the, in the world. And the so-called goal is to create these kind of piles and assemblages of on, on the platform in different scales. And this means different things for different people. Um, so so th in the classical workflows, design kind of starts from either like pure abstraction, which is a mathematical primitive or, or, or rule-based kind of algorithmic system or through s some kind of symbolic object. Uh, but we want to start from objects found online, um, like the internet debris, the, the kind of the messy uh, you know, asset packages that you can find, and something undefined that we can only call content. So this idea of content is something we work with. And the question of, the, of this seminar is like, what is, the, what is creativity in the age of content in some ways? Because content is not data, or information or knowledge, this is content is how all of that kind of exists together, melted together in the regime of software. And it is this endless proliferation of objects and images without an original, with no regard to the kind of referential plane, without any interest in the authenticity of anything. It's just something like an endless kind of landfill accumulating to cover, you know, the last vestiges of like modernity. Um, so content infects, reprograms, and makes obsolete classical modernist workflows that are based on clarification and abstraction. And um, it's also, for me, what is important is that it reprograms the cognitive and creative procedures of design and compelling us to kind of construct new procedures. So we work towards uh, production of micro genres and, and, and uh, kind of these small pockets of expression based on affinity and liking. Um, and then we formalize these elements and understand what constitutes kind of a genre or a personal expression and what it takes to produce a coherent one, right? So we work with screenshots uh, 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 without any post-process, this idea of, of kind of collapsing the, the production, post-production. And we are interested in the idea of simulation as an aesthetic problem. Uh, and uh, because we think that th this kind of proposes novel paths of understanding digital design procedures as cognitive labor or, but I do agree with, with the guys that were talking about clicking that it's actually more like manual labor. Um, so students produce a massive catalog of, of models, of screenshots to establish like a collective search space. And then we try to evaluate and think how to select on that large scale. Uh, so every student makes like 100 images every week. That's the rule. And in the end, we produce, in the, in the course of this seminar, we make uh, something like 140 gigabytes of content, 30,000 screenshots, 500 videos, 250 versions of apps. And then we try to make an exhibition somehow. Um, so I think just, just to end with this is, is that the kind of the general climate is to go away from causality to correlation, which means that we move away from fundamentally grounded models of making into something more open-ended. Uh, and uh, what's really at stake eventually is the possible in inadequacy or even obsolescence of the scientific method as we know it, and the idea of modeling as we know it. Um, so correlation is enough, and, and um, Correlation or, or pattern is the new model, and similarity or likeness replaces cause and effect. This is something that is uh, kind of at the core of this idea. Um, yeah, thanks.
Thank you, Damien. Uh, so next is Jay, and we'll have uh, Q&A after for these three lightning talks.